Right, here we go on tonight's episode of Knicks Fan TV's Court Vision. The regular season is about to kick off, and we're going to take a look back at the preseason, take a look at some of the plays that bedeviled these Knicks earlier on, and some of the adjustments that the coaching staff made to get some more flow within the offense. So let's get right into it. CP, Tommy D, Knicks Fan TV, Court Vision. Let's go. <laughs> You know, Tommy, early on in this offseason, Coach Tom Thibodeau is going on record by saying that he wants the Knicks to take good shots. And these good shots are not only going to help them offensively, uh, but defensively as well, especially in how they defend in transition. What were some of the things that you saw early on in this preseason that kind of spoke to those points? Well, I think it's fair to just throw the first game out the window, a uh, very sloppy performance. A, a lot of good stuff, certainly, from game one. Game two was where we saw the, the adjustments from Dwayne Casey and the Pistons. They basically said, listen, you guys can't shoot from three, so we're going to play some zone, whether it was matchup or whether it was just straight up 2-3. Here is a little 1-3-1, one, one, which was also a matchup as well. Um, would have liked to see New Orleans Noel get there to the short corner, uh, but instead they decided, I don't know if they thought it was man, but they decided to run a pick and roll. Uh, and this is just the miscommunication that the offense uh, has been struggling with uh, before they made the adjustments in game three uh, against Cleveland, which we'll get to. But you obviously can't run a slice cut with Alec Burks through uh, the, the middle of the paint going away from the basket with six seconds left on the shot clock. Uh, one of the great sayings that I was taught and I learned was the best defense against a transition offense is your best shot offensively which is to say if you take a bad shot, you're going to get stuck in transition and you're going to be on your heels. And it's going to be one of those uh, things that teams are going to pick up on here. Blake Griffin is a very good transition ball handler for a big guy, gets the rebound, gets them out in their, their offense. Now, of course, the Pistons are not the best transition team. We understand that. But CP, you and I both know this is a copycat league. So if the Knicks continue to get pushed back against the shot clock with these, these type of lineups, uh, we're going to see – uh, Alfred Payton, Julius Randle, and the like, Alec Burks, struggle against the teams in the league um, who have no problem rebounding and getting out in transition. Yeah, they, they're going to see it early and often, man. You look at the team like a Miami Heat who, who runs zone quite frequently and uh, one of the better teams in transition as well. You know, Knicks were, were lucky enough to play the Detroit Pistons, but you see here a classic example of, uh, you know, lack of execution, miscommunication, and Detroit's off to the races. Spacing as well. You know, here's the same group, Pistons up by four, uh, you know, and in timing. You know, here's RJ's ready, his hands are ready, you know, pass me the ball. The ball's late and the pass is low, so he doesn't have a chance to actually take that shot. Mason Crumley's running at him, and, you know, now he's got to give the ball up because the thing's not on time. Randall makes a nice play, would have been a hockey assist for Barrett. Barrett did make the right play, but because the choppiness of the offense was a thing early on, uh, you know, it's a little out of rhythm there and the ball doesn't go in. And, and all of a sudden now here the Pistons go off to the races again. And, and you know, early in the season, this is going to be an issue for me. I believe we saw uh, in the last clip there that um, the Knicks were able to defend it. But uh, here no one stops ball and right down Broadway for Blake Griffin. Blake Griffin, one of the best finishers in the game, even if he's about 75% of what he was. Yeah, absolutely. The the little things, as you say, you know, Burks missing RJ on target with that pass. Uh, RJ getting it back to Randall, who gets it to Burks for a wide open look, but it seemed like the play was kind of broken at, at that point, and uh, Nick's unable to get a stop on Blake in transition. And here's another one. Here you, you got 10 seconds left in the clock. You got five guys standing around the perimeter. Definitely not a good sign. You could see Tib, uh, Coach Thibodeau was calling for something. I don't know if it was the ISO mid-range elbow, you know, the, the Carmelo Anthony special there <laughs> from Randall, but certainly out of rhythm. And what, what does that lead to? Again, it leads to a rebound. Fortunately for the Pistons, they or for the Knicks, rather, uh, RJ does a really nice job stopping ball, um, and the Pistons put up a, a stinker of their own and uh, back down the other end. Here we go. Uh, sloppy, but again, Here's uh, Coach Stibbs saying, you know, let's let's run something. How about someone? How about a ball screen? How about something? Just move the ball. But you could just tell that they were totally sputtering in this possession, uh, and and it uh, fortunately didn't hurt them at the other end. But starting to see a pattern here with this group. Yeah, last thing you want is uh, shot clock going down and, and Julius Randle forced to make a play from, you know, outside on the perimeter. You know, so typically uh, bad things happen there, and uh, certainly did for the Knicks on this possession. 
Yeah, it's just it looks like it's a bunch of guys who don't want to shoot and just haven't played a lot together, uh, which you can understand. But that's still still that's not going to be an ideal scenario. And these are the other things, too, especially when you're talking about R.J. Barrett. Um, you know, uh, from a point guard perspective, this is the stuff that I really try to pay a lot of attention to. You know, Dennis Smith calling a pick and roll, going to his weak hand uh, with his role man being Julius Randle and, and R.J. being the bump guy. But I really want you to notice here the pass that Smith throws to Barrett. Again, wide open, right there, 36%. RJ's not a great shooter, but he can make that shot. But the pass is low, and it's got a weird spin to it. You'll see that in a second with this, with the next uh, uh, angle of it. Not a bad shot, but just, again, a little bit off rhythm. And you see here, 25% last year from the field and 30% from three off of Dennis Smith Jr.'s passes. Why is that? It's because – I got to be honest, Dennis Smith, not a great passer. He's not a point guard. He doesn't know how to get his shooters the ball in the right way. And we'll drill down a little bit more of that as we go along here. But you just watch the ball with the spin come out of the hands. It's just not a crisp pass. It's not on target, and it's not on time, and the result is a miss. And we're talking about a, a guy who's not a great shooter. Yes, we're playing, you know, we're maybe making some apologies here for RJ, but to me, you got to help your teammate out by just doing one thing well for them. And that's giving it to the ball, give them, giving them the ball on time and on target. Look at the awkward spin on the pass. It's low and it just becomes uh, instead of a nice flowing pass to a nice shot, it's a, you know, sort of a herky jerky motion. Yeah. As we said, the little things, you know, the little things to get a guy a, a good shot and rhythm uh, could be the difference in, in the shot going in and, and the long rebound going the other way. Absolutely. And now they do the right thing here. They get the ball in the middle, but they don't have anybody in the short corner. What I like to call, uh, it, there's a difference between a short corner and the dunker spot. But for me, Noel being here uh, in sort of like a short corner baseline situation, this is not a good shot. It was There's eight seconds left on the clock. If Peyton had cut a little bit earlier, he would have been open on the backside, which I think would have been a layup. But again, just guys not having played together, uh, Wright does a good job of getting to the nail, gets the ball back to Griffin. But here's the other thing, too. Plumley very smartly back screening Peyton here. Randall has no clue where Hayes is, and that's an easy three. You're going to see a lot of this, especially against Peyton and against Randall in transition with just really smart bigs like Plumley setting screens and, you know, game planning. And Griffin's a nice passer. It was a nice drop in the bucket type of pass to the rookie who wasn't shooting it great. But, you know, uh, he's going to be he's going to have to be able to make this one if he's going to want to stick in the league. Yeah. Er early preseason game, you know, guys not really having their chemistry there. As you said, Peyton uh, doesn't make the cut in a timely fashion, ends up with a with a uh, a bad baseline shot by Noel there. And then on the other end, Pumley makes a smart play. You know, you're going to catch Randall sleeping on a couple plays a game for sure. And uh, they catch the miscommunication there between Randall and Peyton and, and make him pay. Now let's look at some of the good plays as we go into the preseason games three and four things got better for the Knicks. I like the aggressiveness. Now you're going to say, well, you know, Emmanuel quickly's in the game and they started playing the young guys and look what happened. Well, it's more than that. We've mentioned the dunker spot before. It's one of my favorite things to teach. And, and listen, this is Obi Toppin coming into the league already understanding this. If you're a coach and say, Hey, listen, get to the dunker spot. He knows exactly what you're talking about. And that is getting underneath towards the baseline and just reading the play. It's it's a it was a great read. You can throw the lob to Mitch. And last time, remember you and I talked about how are they going to be incorporated together? Well, there's one great example. Here's another great example. We talked about some horns, but this is more of a double high screen set where the goal here is to get quickly to turn the corner and to sort of put the onus on the the wing defender guarding Bullock. It's either a kick out or a lob to Mitch. But what I love about this play is the savvy from quickly and great defense from the Cavs, but he doesn't panic. He makes a really smart decision here, pulls up under control. How many times have you seen a point guard be able to do this for them over the last couple of years? We've been begging Neil Aquino to be able to do it consistently. He comes in and does it right, right off the bat. Now here's Mitch in the dunker spot as a decoy. And look what happens. It brings Maker all the way down to him and opens up the, the center of the court, the nail, right where you can absolutely attack. But I love the communication here between Quickly and Knox, which tells Robinson to go to the high post and catch a high post entry. 
quick then dribble sort of pass handoff action to quickly. And then we've got what the Knicks, I think right now are establishing themselves, especially with Robinson is a threat to get the lob every single time. And that's really difficult to guard, but the, the camaraderie that the communication together is something I think is really important there that you definitely didn't see in Detroit. Uh, you know, these are the type of plays that you want to see Mitchell Robinson making. I, I know a lot of people want to see him, you know, turn into the next Anthony Davis. But I, I think it, if he could just go out there and continue to keep the offense flowing, uh, execute well on the screens, keeping the defender on his hip. You know, as you said, that timely coordination between himself and the floor general setting it up for the Gotham lob. I think these are the plays that will help Knicks make this offense a lot better. And you mentioned flow and he's a great screener. And when you can just use him as a screener like you do here to get Knox, who's a 35% shooter from the right slot here. Now, people talk about numbers and how do you apply it? Well, here's how you apply it. Kevin Knox can shoot from that spot. R.J. Barrett can pass from that, you know, pass it to him in that spot. Unlike what we saw with Smith to, to Barrett before, this pass is on time with the laces on target. So Knox, who had already made a couple, can get into his rhythm. Last year, Knox shot. 45, you can see the rotation there is absolutely perfect. He shot 46% off of Barrett's passes last year. Now, that doesn't mean he needs to get a lot of passes from Barrett, but if he can get some passes from Barrett, and if he can get some passes from Quickly, and if he can get some passes from Toppin, who's shown that he's going to – I love the swagger bounce, by the way. Yeah. But if, if, if he can get – you know, now you're starting to accumulate teammates together out of the five who are getting him touches in the right way. He's going to make shots, and that's what he did against Cleveland the other night. Yeah, as you said with Kevin Knox, right, it may not necessarily be about getting the passes from RJ, but what it what you've seen from his passes from RJ and also from Quickly is that if you get him within rhythm and you get him, you know, with the, with the laces out there properly, he's going to knock that down, and that's what you want to see Kev, um, his role be. You know, that's what you want to see from Kev, and those last two home games, I think he started shooting from about 50% from three, so nice bounce back from Kev and certainly ending the preseason on a hot streak. Hopefully he can continue that into this season. Yes, he's a flawed player. Yes, he has issues defensively, but he scores so easily. Here it is again, 34% from the left slot. This is two years of sample now that we've seen from him. He can shoot if he can, as he's allowed to just step into his shot again, right on time, right on target. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Like you sit there and you're like, well, what did he have? 10, 12 points the other night. He had the quietest 20 points. He took seven shots from three, he made six. And it was just so easy. And when it's easy for him, then it can be easy for other teammates too. Here's Barrett, who we, again, know is not a great shooter, but gets a better pass than he did from Dennis Smith. And this is from a big in Spellman who's not even going to play. But he's, he's able to get the ball again. And this is – I love the hop into the jump shot. You didn't see a lot of that last year. He's been working on that with Drew Hanlon. He's probably been working on that with Nash too, who's now coaching with the Nets, we know. But And look at that confidence after hitting the shot. This all comes from good passing, good spacing, good togetherness. And this is what you saw here, much better possessions than what you saw in the second. And even the third – Three, you know, the third game in the first three quarters at the Garden. Yeah, and, and a nice job by Julius. I thought in game four, Julius did a nice job of kind of slowing things down and looking uh, to set his teammates up there, getting the hockey assist from Spellman to RJ as well. And I think that's ideally what you want to see Julius doing, you know, looking to get his teammates involved first and foremost before himself and getting these guys into a good rhythm. And we'll talk more about Julius as the year goes on because he's going to get minutes and he's going to be relied on. He's certainly going to be in front of Toppin, which I like, shows the veteran some respect. But now you're going to put Toppin with the kids and maybe see a little RJ as a primary ball handler and you'll see stuff like this, this towards the, the end of the this game. This is the play of the preseason right here, man. This, this tells you everything that you need to know. This is synergy. This is you don't just need to throw it to Robinson if there's going to be help from the corner. Maybe Knox is open in the opposite corner, or maybe Obi just goes back door. And RJ, you'll see it here. I love this angle. I love these angles. Awesome job getting this this content. I just so good. And the look away from from RJ. That there, yeah. there's swagger there. There's confidence. There's you know let's open the floor up. Let's let's let let this be our team. Let's get out here. I'm tired of losing. Like let's just go. Uh, I would use the, uh, a different phrase, but uh, you know it's a family show here. But that's exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. Breaking the double team, finding space. This is high IQ basketball, and you can't teach this. This is synergy, and this is why I'm so excited about the two of them playing together. 
Yeah, definitely excited, man. As you said, we, we saw the kids coming alive during those last two preseason games. Uh, quickly has certainly been impressive himself, man. He, we showed him that clip uh, off of that double screen. Him being, first off, attacking the screen well and then sealing off his defender like a vet. And then we saw the teardrop, the floater. We, we saw the floater and the teardrop uh, come out more than the three-point shot from Quickly. So um, certainly showing an ability to, one, get into the lane with a quick first first step um attack those closeouts as well but also be able to to kind of be a dual threat in terms of getting the floater there or the gotham lob might be there over the top as well i had a hot take that caught a little fire unintentionally the other day saying that quickly is what we all thought and fans all thought nilakina should be by now and that's not a knock on nilakina in fact i think the two of them together are going to be really, really good. And I, and I heard Coach Thibodeau talk about that today, about the versatility and how he likes guys who can play on the ball and guys who can play off the ball. And the two of them together with an RJ, maybe with Knox, definitely with the top end, definitely with Mitch, even probably with, with Nerlens, the two of them I think are going to be able to not only be really good defensively, but play off one another, get into gaps. There's not going to be that Frank Dennis Smith you know, butting of the heads, that Trier, Dotson, butting of the heads, who should be getting more minutes. The, it, for me, it's just now about who can play with the ball, who can play without the ball. And I think quickly for sure can. Nilakina, I believe, turned a big corner at the end of last year. So the two of them together, I think, could be really dynamic. And it gives Coach Thibodeau a lot of options with what he wants to do with the roster. And that's exciting. You know, we, we saw OB come out a little bit in, in that first preseason game and, and showed off some of the skill sets that we had talked about on episode one of, of Court Vision. Um, tailored off a bit as the preseason went along. I think he's, it's going to take some time for him to get up to speed, also adjust in certain lineups, depending on which point guard he's playing with. We, we saw in game two, uh, he was very ineffective playing with an ineffective DSJ. So we'll see who they pair him with. I think that's going to be critical for his development and growth this season as well. But Although the offense kind of struggled to come along, you still saw, um, as you said, the, the offensive awareness and IQ out there on display. I thought he was still playing good team ball, making crisp passes as well, and just being in the right spots, as we showed on the clips earlier. I think he was dealing with a little of an ankle, a little bit of an ankle issue as well, um, sort of getting over the first hurdle of, you know, being a little nicked up. Um, I think he's going to come out tomorrow with a lot of energy. Uh, I think his legs will be under him. And he'll just have that rocky rookie, you know, um, road of, you know, one day being great, legs feel great, and then next day maybe not feeling so great. Um, but what I love most about him is the passing. Knox doesn't go off the other night to the point w which he did without Toppin's first pass, which was out of the post, and it was a, one of those really nice cross-court passes to the corner. Yeah. Um, that found Knox perfectly on time, perfectly on target, and uh, Knox knocked it down. So the ability to have that uh, player in the post who can feel the double and find his guys, uh, you know, is, is something that um, they haven't really had at that level um, because Topin, Toppin can most definitely be able to get past his man in the post and, uh, and make, you know, really quick, decisive moves. Uh, we've seen that as well. So one-on-one, on one, he's going to be very hard to guard in the post. And we know what he can do in pick and roll. But to the point we were talking about before with him and Mitch, you saw some of the stuff here, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of examples of how the two of them can really work together. And you can get dunks not only just from the law, but also from dunker spot and baseline, backdoor cuts, things of that nature. Absolutely, man. Well, they're getting ready to kick this thing off for real. Starting off in Indiana against the Pacers, home opener against the Philadelphia 76ers, and then a back-to-back -back against the Greek Freak and those Milwaukee Bucks, man. So uh, they're going to kick it off soon, and I'm looking forward to doing some more uh, film breakdowns in Knicks Fan TV's Court Vision, man. Tommy D, great job as usual. Appreciate it, man. Listen, uh, yeah, the, the the season starts tomorrow in the NBA. Were there games tonight? I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow night for me starts 7, 7 p.m. Real deal. <laughs> tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Keep it locked to Knicks Fan TV. Leave a comment below on what you guys thought about tonight's film breakdown, and uh, we'll be sure to reply back, man. Peace.